Indeed. Okay. So let's dig back in the tissues. Um, so I want to try to chop through as much of this as possible because a lot of this is helping us in our lab studies and our study through tissues as well. So a lot of this is converging. So I want to try to move through as much of this as possible so that you have as much of that support as possible. So let's go ahead and, and continue on. Remember last time I basically mentioned I wanted to stop at this slide. And I wanted to kind of go back. We talked a little bit about squamous, right? The classification of the tissues themselves. And so there's two different designations. So there's layering classification. That's always going to be a, And layering comes in a couple of varieties. And then there was, of course, shape. And the shape is actually probably the easiest one, right? Because you have squamous cells, which are flattish. And I drew a picture of that here. Uh, cuboidals, which actually not so cleverly look like a cube, right? So they're cuboid. So they kind of look like a little bit of a square. There's variations on that theme. And then, of course, columnar, which tend to be you know, like rectangles, but in real life, when you take a look at a real columnar, they don't look like super ideal, right? Like you would draw a rectangle, they can be smushed and there could be strain associated, especially if they're stratified in nature. Now, in terms of layering, uh, a single layer is the most simple. So you have your simple layer, so just one layer, a stratified, which is multiple layers, and then you have what's called a stratified. Um, and what I want to do to sort of explain how you define layering is because you have to diagnose the layer with respect to the architecture of your cells. So that remember in the cell layer, we said we had different surfaces to it, right? You had an apical surface to it, and we had a basal surface to it, where you had the basal membrane associated with it. And so generally speaking, whenever you look at a simple layer, one layer, basically what this means is that the same cell is in contact with both apical and basal. So if you take a look at a layer of cells and you see the one cell that's in contact with both apical and basal, that is a single layer. And that would be a simple, right? Now with stratified, typically what this means is that different cells are in contact with your apical and your basal layer. So you have like, for instance, a cell that's in contact with the basal layer, but is not in contact with the apical layer. And then another layer, which is in contact with the apical piece, but is not in contact with the basal piece. So the reason why we have pseudoscide is because we want to look carefully at who's in contact with the apical surface and who's in contact with the basal. If you're truly stratified, that should be defined two separate cells. If that defines the same cell, if any cell, by the way, has both apical and basal on it, then it is not stratified, okay? The one thing about these tissues, by the way, especially when you're looking at um, these kind of layers of liners, these epithelial tissues, is you cannot change horses in mid-race. If one cell looks uh, columnar, guess what? They're all columnar. You don't get to mix and match. So you pick a horse and you ride it. Okay, so that's the one thing. So that's the reason why I say when we're looking at the pseudostratified, if we can find even just one cell, which is in contact with both apical and basal, that defines a simple layer. That means it is not stratified. Hence the reason why we call it pseudostratified. It looks at first inspection stratified, but it's actually not by definition, okay? And then of course you have transitional and in transitional, oftentimes you can change shape. So this is epithelium, which will oftentimes sort of change from a cuboidal columnar look to more squamous look, depending on whether it's stretched. Generally speaking, transitional is a very, very low priority tissue because we only find it in one place, and that's in the bladder. Okay. Um, but here's kind of what they look like. So it's kind of what it looks like. So here you can see an example of your simple epithelium. So you can see you've got your basal surface here and you've got your apical surface here. So that defines one layer. So this would be one layer of simple but squamous because it is flat. Now, let's take a look at stratified. 
in stratified, you'll have multiple layers. So here's a good example of it. So here's our basal membrane down here, our basement membrane. Here's our apical surface up here. Notice the same cell is not in contact with both, is it? You have a basal layer, this guy right here, and you have an apical layer, this guy right here, but a whole lot of cells in between that are in contact with neither, right? So that's stratification. Now, none of that, but I want you to take a look at something. Even though in an individual cell, we have our three shape designations, right? Flat squamous cells, cuboidal cells, and columnar cells. When you stratify them, they can distort. So here's a good example. This entire sample is stratified, multiple layers, and it is squamous, all of it. It's an example of pick a horse and ride it. You don't switch up in the middle of the race. Here's where the confusion comes in. So you, you're basically taking a look at me and you're like, okay, I'll go for that. When I look at this stuff up here, that looks kind of flat. That looks like there's multiple layers. I'll go for that, right? But then as you start to get more basal, notice the cells start to look a little different, don't they? Instead of being so flat, all of a sudden, they're starting to look a little bit more cuboid in nature, right? Now, you didn't change tissues. It's all one tissue. So this is all one cell type. So what you're seeing here is often the shape distorts basally. When it is thickly stratified. That's always something to watch out for. So notice they're squamous at the top, looking more cuboid at the bottom, but they are still the same. They would classify it as the same cell type. They're still stratified squamous. That hasn't changed, nor are they transitional, right? Because you didn't stretch anything here. This is just the same thing. This is just a consequence of layering. So the reason why you have this is because um, generally speaking, as a tissue, as you start getting depth in a tissue, you start to submit those lower cells to stresses and strains of all the cells that are piling up on top of them. And so oftentimes that has a kind of a mushing or a kneading effect on those lower cells, which can distort and change their shape a little bit, even though they basically are still squamous in nature. It's just that what's happened is because of the stress and the strain of all the cells on top of them, their shape has been distorted. Just like if you're working a lump of dough, okay? It's kind of that stress and strain is distorting that shape a little bit. So what does that mean for you? When you're identifying and trying to determine what this type of tissue is, the important strategy is always diagnose at the apical surface. So what it is at the apical surface is gonna be what it is throughout, regardless of what it looks like at the basal side. Why? Because if I were to take, say for instance, an equally striated or an equally, an equally stratified columnar group of cells, what I would see are cells at the basal layer that would look almost identical to this, that kind of more cuboidish looking shape. So all the cells, if they're thick enough, will end up looking something like this as they get basally because they get that huge pile up on top of them. So the only way to determine one from the other is to always look apical because those guys haven't had a bunch of stuff piled up on top of them yet. And so they retain their original native shape. And that's the definition of the tissue throughout, okay? So this is the reason why I say this is stratified squamous. Why? Not because I look down here, but because I looked up here. And up here, it is clearly without question, flat squamous, and there's multiple layers stratified, okay? So everything ends up looking like this if you pile enough stuff off top of it. So that's your um, epithelial tissue. So here's kind of what it looks like. Here's your simple squamous. This is about as simple as you can get. And so this is, there's a series of functions here for this, right? So the reason why you would do like a simple squamous is because you have a particular reason for that, right? Why not extra layers? Well, because you don't need them, number one. 
maybe you don't have the kind of chafing and frictional issues in this particular area. So you don't need a bunch of extra layers, right? Or maybe in this particular case, your function is more physiological. So all those extra layers would get in the way. It would create like a sense of insensitivity, right? Um, so that's, uh, that's one thing. So for instance, a good example of that would be, um, you know, if I, if I am doing something with a lot of fine motor controls where I have to be able to sense and feel a lot of fine texture differences with my fingers, then having that extra layer of glove is going to be it's going to be a negative to my function, right? So I'm not going to be able to feel things as well. So what I do, I take off that extra layer so I can feel all those different textural changes, right? So if I'm like, uh, if I'm uh, playing an instrument, for instance, or, or something of that nature, or like a braille situation, right? So you need, uh, this wouldn't be good for braille. You would have to have just your bare fingers for braille because you have to feel those textural differences. So these, a lot of times these are associated with physiological membranes or physiological liners. We will see a lot of these in AMP2, okay? So uh, these sort of single layer epithelial pieces tend to be very physiologically functional. Um, simple, keeping with the layering situation, columnars, uh, you can see how they're clearly a uh, larger columnar. This is an example of it. So when you take a look at the large column, um, it oftentimes looks like a picket fence. So if you look closely at the individual cells, you'll notice that they are fitting the definition of simple. The same cell is in contact with both apical and basal. So that defines the simple layer. That's one layer definition. But then when you take a look at it, they're elongated into rectangles and none of that, but you can oftentimes see that because the nuclei often tend to be um, sort of organized in a line. So it's not uncommon to sort of see these sort of uh, columnar cells which looks something like this. Looks kind of like a little picket fence. Oops, that's a little. Looks something like that. And, and its orderliness oftentimes is, is quite immediately in, uh, impressive, right? So you take a look at it and be like, oh, hey, cool. Oh, look at that, it's got a bunch of little picket fences, like little pickets all lined up in a row. When you see that, you're probably looking at a columnar. And so it does look very much like this particular sample here. Sticking with uh, simple, we are gonna go through to uh, the pseudostratified situation. Now with pseudostratified, what's gonna happen is this is a situation where you see some of these guys are not going to be adhering to a simple definition. For instance, the, the first look of them, because they're sort of scattered a little bit, it looks as though there's two rows of columns, right? That, that would suggest stratification. So if you put two rows of columns, you kind of see two pickets on top of each other. That kind of gives you, so if you see two rows of nuclei, that usually means you're looking at two separate layers. That's not the case here. Even though you kind of have one layer that looks like it's going through here and another layer that looks like it's going through here just by just looking at the nuclei. If you look very closely, you'll notice that actually this guy right here has an apical surface, but here he ends. So he does not have a basal surface. Now that looks to you like, oh, hey, wait a minute. That's the top layer. The bottom layer should do the same, right? They should all look like that. But let's take a look at this guy. This guy right here has both an apical surface and a basal surface. So does this guy, apical and basal. So does this guy, apical and basal. So it's a mixture of some cells that appear at first glance as though they only have one or the other, apical but not basal, basal but not apical. Those are those little triangular shaped ones. But then if you look very closely, you'll notice that no, there's actually a handful of these guys or a few of these, depending on the nature of the tissue, that actually has clearly cells that go apical to basal. That's a definition, by the way, of simple. Right, so even though it looks at first appearance by the way the nuclei are arranged, like it's stratified, two layers, in reality, when you take a closer look at it, you diagnose it, it actually adheres to the simple definition. Right? That's the reason why you call it pseudo stratified, false stratification, but they're also columnar. Now, stratified squamous. <clears throat> 
So this is one that's pretty obvious. So you can see stratified squamous is what it is. So you can see basically you've got this pile up of squamous cells. This is what we just saw. So here at the apical surface, you can see they're flattish and multi-layered. So that's where you diagnose it. So clearly this would be stratified squamous. As you start to get further further down to the basement membrane, you can see they kind of start to look a little bit more cuboid in nature. Um, the difference between these ones and like a true cuboid tissue is that these guys actually, if you look closely at them, they're not so much cuboid, they're, they're more like what I would call ovoid. So they're not like a square, they're more like an oval a little bit, if you really, really closely at them. Um, and that's because when you're putting that strain on them, it doesn't just mash them into nice little even boxes. It kind of just mushes all over them and then kind of just turn into this sort of oval shaped cell. So this is your stratified squamous. By the way, you guys have an example of this in your histology set, right? It's called the scalp slide. So when you take a look at the epidermis, the upper layer, that purple layer, that's all stratified squamous. Okay. Now then, cuboidal. Now, first of all, stratified cuboidal is actually pretty rare, but sometimes you do see it. So for instance, here you can see there's clearly two rows of nuclei um, and they're not very big. So you're not like columns, right? You can see they're, they're like little stacked blocks on top of each other. And so you can see that you get the stratified look. Usually two layers is about as much as you see. Most cuboidal tissue is single layer. Okay? It's very rare to see um, two layers, but you do see it like we see it in AMP1 in the sweat glands um, and salivary glands. But for the most part, it's pretty rare to see uh, stratified cuboid. Then we have a stratified columnar. So we have multiple layers of the columnar. So you can see how you can see these like rows of nuclei on top of each other. That nice orderly lining of nuclei suggests that there's multiple layers um, of these um, cells on top of them. Notice what happens to those cells underneath. We've only gotten three deep and what are those cells already starting to look like? They're starting to look more cuboidal, right? Because of the pressure of those layers on top. So that's the reason why you always go with the apical surface, diagnose it there and know that you don't change horses in mid race. Right, so what it is at the apical surface is exactly what it is at the basal surface, it doesn't matter. Right, so these would be columnar cells, but they're stratified. So, if you're looking at a slide, it's like the apical side, the one that like looks like floating. So, if it depends on the cell, the slide, it depends on the sample. Typically speaking, when you're a liner, like epithelial cells tend to be. Um, generally speaking, there is an open area. If you're a gland, there's oftentimes a lumen or an internal open chamber that you're pointing toward, that would be the apical surface. Um, if you are um, like tracheal linings, that's the pseudostratified ciliated epithelium, there's an opening, the airway is the opening area, so that would be the case. Um, so generally speaking, whenever you're building an epithelial liner, you're laying down your basement membrane, you're sticking your cells to it, and then whatever is opposite the basement membrane is generally your free air, the free space. So it's usually pointing towards some opening. Even when you're talking about something like simple squamous, where you're talking about like the liner of an artery, well, the opening of the artery, the open area of the artery is the lumen. So that would be the free space side. And then the basement membrane would be the opposite side. Does that make sense? So you're always typically, because you're always usually lining something that encapsulates some sort of an opening or a cavity or some sort of a chamber, there's always usually an open or a free area. Um, so, well, it depends, right? Because like on the slide, you see the trachea, you'll see the entire liner. You'll see the basement membrane lining the trachea. You'll see the free area where it's open, where you're breathing air through. On an artery slide, if you get a longitudinal cross section, you'll see the open area of the artery where the blood goes through, where that where it defines the free space, and then on the that's on the opposite side of that would be the basement membrane. So it's always it's always something like this. It's always how many times can I do this in my life? Um, so it always it's always something like this, some version of it. You've got your simple squamous. You got your basement membrane, and then usually there's some sort of an open area on the opposite side of it. That's just part, that's just how you do a liner, right? Yeah. 
right? Because the idea is like you always have a liner and then to basically just be like connective tissue down here or your cavity wall or whatever. Um, but there's always, when you're lining something, it's usually you're lining it in the context of an open space. And that automatically defines your apical surface. Does that make sense? Or I mean, what I just drew up there. Uh, well, sagittal would be going this direction, right? So because you're not looking like straight down on it, you're looking at it like you're seeing all the layers. That'd be a transverse, transverse. cross section. Yeah, the transverse, the one that cuts you like this. Yeah. yeah. So this would be a longitudinal section that I did. The transverse would be basically looking down the center of the of the tooth. Okay. Yeah, or whatever it is. A gland is just like a, a hollow ball, right? That would be an example. You're kind of lining the hollow ball. But generally speaking, there's always some sort of an air chamber, some sort of a chamber, fluid filled chamber, or something like that, that you are lining. That's usually always the case. So you always have that built in free space. Okay. So um, the outlier, transitional, right? So the transitional, largely we're looking at the bladder um, and related um, organs associated with that, urethra, that sort of thing. So it's kind of like an extension of the same liner. Uh, this was an important one, right? Because when you take a look at it, it has two different looks to it, depending on whether or not it's stretched or not. So when it's relaxed, so when it's in its sort of non-stretched area, the, the cells will actually look ovoid in nature. Even at the surface, remember, we're not talking about the ovoid deep. We're talking about the apical surface ones, always look ovoid. And so you can see at the apical surface, which is where you do your diagnosis, you take a look at those cells, you're like, whoa, 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 wait, wait, wait. What is that? It's not flat, right? They're not columnar, they're not cuboid. They're kind of ovoid, right? So they're kind of like neither here nor there. I can't call this like columnar ovoid, right? Because that these oval cells are not at the base, they're at the apical. So what tissue is ovoid by definition at the apical surface? That would be transitional. Why? Because when it's not stretched, it looks ovoid. Everything kind of looks ovoid throughout. And then when you stretch it, all of a sudden it looks squamous. So when you stretch it out, these cells flatten out and then they kind of look flat and squamous like. Okay. And then it kind of goes back. So it kind of goes back and forth and back and forth. So you get a full bladder, it looks more like this. You empty out your bladder, it looks more like this, and back and forth and back and forth, okay? So sometimes if you see stretched tissue, it'll look simple squamous, or if you see non-stretched tissue, usually that one will confuse students. They'll be like, we didn't have a ovoid. Yeah, we did, transitional, okay? Okay. Now, now that we kind of have a little bit of the parts, at least in terms of uh, simple tissue, what about functional stuff? Well, let's take a look at a little bit of this. This is a little bit of general bio. And so I just kind of want to cover some of this. And this basically, these are functions that cover actually multiple systems, right? So this is just to sort of highlight some of these ideas just very briefly, uh, because a lot of this is, uh, some of this is unpacked in um, general bio, and some of this is unpacked deeply in AMP2, um, right? So the, a lot of times the question would be like, okay, this is great. So what is, why? Why simple, right? Why not stratified? Is that a good thing? More the merrier, right? Go Texas, go big or go home kind of a thing. Um, well, here's the reason why, because typically when you have a simple layer of epithelial tissue, it means you're not interested in physical function, you're interested in physiological function. And when you're talking about physiological function, these are the things you're talking about. So if you're a single layer, then what are likely some of the things that you're doing? Well, some of the things you're likely doing physiologically are things like diffusion, right? where you're basically moving molecules back and forth across this epithelial membrane. Or filtration, which is kind of related to diffusion, only in this case, it's like pushing stuff across a sieve. So in this case, the membrane's acting like a sieve or like a flour sifter, right? To basically screen out molecules. And so you get to that in the urinary system a lot. Um, you can secrete things or you can absorb things. That is to say, you can take things up or secrete them. This also happens in the urinary system. 
uh, protection. That's the one we know of, right? So protection from the outside world or from chafing or friction. Um, mucus production, that's another one. Um, that's the pseudostratified ciliated roll. That's the trachea, so that's what it does for a living. Um, and there's a lot of other things as well, right? So when you have these, typically when you see a single simple stratified, or excuse me, a simple squamous layer of epithelium, typically what you're looking at is something that has a physiological functional role. That's why it's there. It's not a physical protective barrier role like your skin. That's usually stratified squamous, right? So like, you, here's a good example of the idea of structure function, right? The, the structure is kind of giving you some tips and some hints about what they do. So if I need to protect myself from friction and chafing, guess what? I'm gonna thicken up my skin. By the way, your skin does that automatically, doesn't it? How many of you guys work with your hands, right? How many of you guys have like big old gnarly calluses on your hands? Yeah, that's you responding to friction and chafing, protecting yourself because you realize that there's more friction and chafing going on there than in the rest of the part of your body. So you're basically protecting yourself from the excess friction. Okay. So um, that's, that's that. So some of the different tissue types and their location. So this is kind of helpful for you table people. So when you take a look at stratified epithelium, so the previous one was, ep was um, simple. This is stratified. So where do you see stratified? Obviously the skin, we just talked about that one. Um, the movement of something. Notice if you're moving stuff, that is movement. So there's frictional rub associated with that. So you can see that associated with the larynx. Um, movement and of, of, uh, of urine in this particular case. So you're going to have more layers. Notice they all have something in common, don't they? Basically, when you have stratified tissue, it's because there's something moving through there, creating frictional type of of chafing, some rub. And so as a result, you bolster up your layers to protect you from that rub. Now, obviously the kind of chafing that you're getting in your urinary bladder is nothing like what you're getting in your skin, but it's a, but it's a different material, right? So it's a different type of a, of a layering in there, but you have multiple layers because on a physiological level, you still have frictional tension on these surfaces and you need to protect yourself from it. So especially if you happen to be unlucky enough to have some sort of an inclusion passing through your urinary system, um, whether or not it actually turns into a stone, but those are basically solid masses um, that have coagulated, most of which, by the way, you, you urinate out inclusions on a fairly constant basis, but generally speaking, they don't um, aggregate to a large enough size to cause a problem, so we don't even notice it. But if, they, But they're still there, so they're still hard inclusions that are rattling around. So if you have those things kind of pinging around your bladder, running into that bladder wall, you better have a few layers there, right? Because you're probably gonna get some cell tearing and things like that. If you only got one layer, you're screwed, right? So you have multiple layers there because who knows what you've got going through your bladder. It is after all a waste bin, right? And if, and, and, and generally speaking, you want to, um, um, uh, it's, not, it's not a lot of fun. Crawling around in your garbage can is not a good thing. <laughs> your physiological garbage can. Okay. So what about these free surfaces, right? Let's kind of circle back around to that original concept of the free surfaces. So what about these? Um, how, do we, how do we modify these? So epithelium basically will have a free surface, right? They also have a basal surface. They have to have a basal surface because they have to have a foundation, right? To, build their cell liner on. But what about this free surface? What about this apical surface? Well, what can we do there? Well, oftentimes what'll happen is because if you're physiological in nature, which oftentimes you are, then you want to be able to sort of mess with your apical surface, right? So you want your apical surface to sort of match what your physiological function is. In some cases, yeah, that means you need to modify it a little bit. So here's a good example. Um, when you take a look at an epithelial liner, this free surface, sometimes you can basically create, how many times is that now? I quit, um, at least that. So, so basically what you can do is you can create a, a type of epithelial cell, typically squamous in nature. Um, 
that's smooth, that's abnormally smooth. Um, and, and the reason why it's smooth is because it's, its job is to, that one I don't mind so much, is to reduce friction, right? So this basically allows passage of something. Whatever that is, blood, for instance, in your arteries, okay? When we have this sort of smooth, uh, sort of lubricated usually version of epithelium, we usually refer to it as endothelium. It's inside endothelium, it's inside epithelium. Okay, and, and that's what we have. Now, that's one of the modifications we can do. So if we're moving stuff through and we need to reduce friction, then we can create a smoother version of this, grease it up a bit and really reduce that friction. That really helps us out a lot. Uh, you see a lot of this in AMP2 when you guys look at the structure of arteries, okay, the inside endothelium. The other one we can do is, depending on what it is, we can fold up our uh, inner membrane. Um, and so this is uh, an example of what happens with the transitional, right? So the transitional is actually folded. So it's folded and distended in this case. And what this does is it basically changes shape, which essentially means it gives it flexibility. The nice thing about this is it gives the organ flexibility without the high cost of creating another type of tissue we have, connective tissue, right? Most of our flexibility is associated with connective tissue. But think about it, a bladder made of connective tissue, that would not probably be the best idea. So you want something like that's a little less structurally robust for this one, but you still want it to be flexible. So that's what the transitional does. The fact that it can actually fold up allows you to be able to have the best of both worlds. Now, what happens if you are absorbing stuff through your apical surface, which is happening with your intestinal cells. Well, in that case, the more surface area you have, the more absorption you have. And that's a good thing. Because that means if you've got increased surface area, you're able to absorb more of your nutrients, and make use of that and put that to work for you, okay? Now, what does this look like? If you have a cell with microvilli on it, you're gonna have these like little fleshy kind of extensions on it. And then these like little hair-like extensions. So the microvilli increase your surface area so that you can do more absorption across that. So that increases purely like, so in your digestive system, you've got a lot of microvilli. Um, these like little hair-like extensions that it helps to increase your absorptive ability. So you're able to absorb more for less, right? For less cost of structure, you're able to absorb more. Now there are some microvilli in the body that don't do absorption or secretion that are in our sensory system. Stereocilia, for instance, in the inner ear, these are what's called hair cells. which distort mechanically to create a nerve impulse. So hair cells are actually important. Um, they're an important piece of your sensation. Matter of fact, if your hair cells were dead, you'd be deaf. You wouldn't be able to hear anything. Um, and then of course, cilia, which technically speaking um, is an actual uh, structure of the cytoskeleton, the cell cytoskeleton. But oftentimes cilia will be like these hair-like structures like pseudostratified ciliated columnar, right? We already went to that, that one. So these guys are column, columnar cells, which have these little cilia-like fibers, which are extensions of the cytoskeleton that wave back and forth like kelp in a current, basically. Um, and so what they do, is they move mucus. So like in your trachea, for instance, when you take a look at your tracheal cell, 
you'll see a whole series of these pseudostratified ciliated columnar cells. And then what will happen is they all have cilia in them, but some of these guys will have big old blobs of mucus in them. And they'll excrete that mucus to the outside. So you'll have this like layer of mucus on your lining. Now, the reason why you do that in your trachea is to clean up your air. So as you're breathing in dirty air, smoke or whatever, you know, from a forest fire, what's gonna happen is all those particles will go into the air, into your lungs, and those particles will get stuck in the mucus that's in the liner. And those cilia, which are just constantly sweeping backward, will basically sweep up all those dust and dirt particles up your trachea and then into your cough reflex and then you'll cough it out. So the reason why when you're breathing in a lot of particulate matter, you start coughing things out and you kind of, and if you're doing it a lot, you start to get that kind of crackly, phlegmy cough. That's because you've got an excess, your cells here are making an excess of mucus because they realize, whoa, we're breathing in a crap ton of stuff. So we need to make more mucus, collect and stick more stuff so it doesn't go into your lungs and then sweep that out. So the more you breathe in, the more crackly your cough gets. This is one of the reasons why smokers have that wonderful little crackly smoker's cough like all the time because when they inhale a smoke particle, it's getting caught in their tracheal mucus and it's getting swept up, which is the reason why they're always constantly coughing and spitting. <laughs> uh, well, it's not necessarily positive because it's constantly going on. Like right now, your pseudostratified ciliated uh, columnar cells on your trachea are now, as you speak, making mucus and sweeping. So it's constantly going. Uh, typically speaking, um, it, it, it does have, I don't know how strong of a positive feedback loop it would be to upregulate it, um, but there's probably a little bit of it there. I don't know how steep it was. I mean, usually like a really fast steep response is something that we associate with a strong positive response. Um, tracheally, because you already have a pretty significant baseline there, and it's not an automatic, I mean, like it takes you a while to get to that point. Like, for instance, when you first start, you start off like this, <clears throat> right? That's basically a controlled cough. That's you clearing your throat. Clearing your throat is getting some of that particulate mucus out of your throat so you can deal with it, right? So it starts off that way, and it could be that way for a little while. And then it eventually, it'll, if it continues, it'll start getting to the point where it's starting to upregulate. But it's a long, it's a longer process than what you would expect for a traditional positive feedback loop. Positive feedback loops generally are characterized by taking a process that moves slowly and making it exponential, because it's like a life or life or death kind of a situation. That makes sense. So there is kind of a positive effect and upregulation to it, but I wouldn't necessarily call it aggressive enough to put it into that feedback category. Okay, so those are the liners, right? Um, so we talked a little bit about liners. Now what about the glands? So this is basically where you're gonna be when you hit endocrine system in AMP2, which is the first system you pick up in AMP2. And so when you take a look at, um, at glands, typically speaking, this is where you have epithelium that's specifically designed for secreting stuff. Right, so your job is to secrete stuff to the outside world, to other cells and so forth. And you have two different types of glands that we have. The first one is what's called endocrine glands. And so in an endocrine gland, this is specifically uh, focused because what happens is the hormone in an endocrine gland will immediately be dumped into a blood vessel. So if you see a blood vessel somewhere, then that is an endocrine gland. Okay. Exocrine is a little bit different because in an exocrine situation, they basically have ducts. So these guys will move the hormone for gland specific ducts, a ducting system. And that's how we define so you probably maybe have heard of those terms, endocrine versus exocrine. That's what we're talking about. In an endocrine situation, you're taking your hormone and you're dumping it immediately into the bloodstream for distribution to the rest of the body. In an exocrine situation, you're sending it through a duct. Oftentimes, not all the time, but when you're going through a ducting system, 
And this would define your free face, right? So the opening of the duct would be like the free face piece of it, where you'd be dumping it into that open lumen area. Uh, this would be an example of like where you have a targeted response, right? So like if you're making a hormone that goes that's exocrine in nature, it's like this is a communication that's only designed for a certain group of people, right? Not for general broadcast. If it's endocrine, it's lo you're looking for general broadcast response. Uh, here's a good example. We saw, um, in 2102, we saw uh, slides of pancreas, right? So in pancreas, there's two different tissues, right? There's a structure called the islets of Langerhans, which is a group of cells that basically makes insulin and glucagon, right? And then the rest of the cells around it are what's called acinite tissue. Those guys are the ones who make digestive enzymes and digestive buffers. The endocrine stuff is the islets. That's the insulin glucagon. Why? Because it gets distributed, it gets made, and it gets dumped directly into the bloodstream. Why? Because glucose maintenance throughout your blood, of which insulin and glucagon are part of glucose homeostasis, is a systemic thing. Every cell has to have control of their glucose uptake and utilization. Therefore, insulin and glucagon is a message that goes out to everyone. Okay. Now, exocrine wise the digestive enzymes are only specifically for the digestive system you don't want to send your digestive enzymes throughout the rest of the body number for many reasons number one is the rest of your body doesn't care about their digestive enzymes number two is you would digest yourself that would be a bad day right the pancreatic uh the the like the digestive enzymes from the pancreas is an example of actually That would be exercise, right? Whereas insulin production is endocrine because it goes to the blood. And that's because your target communication is system-wide. Now, when we take a look at exocrine glands, we can classify them based on their structure, like what their ducts look like and things of that nature. So this is kind of um, a little bit about kind of what they look like. So here's, a, here's kind of a unicellular gland. This is like one gland that's kind of talking to other people a good example of this is what's called a goblet cell. Um, a goblet cell is what I just described in the pseudostratified ciliated columnar cells as a mucus producer. It's a columnar cell that basically looks like a goblet in a microscope. Why? Because you basically have the whole upper portion of the cell with this giant droplet of mucus in it. It makes it look like a goblet. What does a goblet look like, you say? Like that. So that's the reason why it's called a goblet cell is because it kind of has this big old blob of mucus in there. Or if you're some other type of gland, you got some sort of other communication that you're going for. Um, this would be, you know, like a blob of something else or some other type of solution or chemical that you're trying to communicate out. Right, so that would be like a unicellular situation where one cell is trying to communicate to everybody else and that happens. Now, when you're talking about glands, you're talking about a group of cells. Remember, basically, first of all, and it didn't mention it here, but one thing I wanna make abundantly clear is generally glands, not always. Generally, glands are avoid cells. Sometimes they're columnar, but mostly cuboid. There are points where if you see a group of cuboid cells, you're probably looking at a gland, okay? So this basically accounts for the majority of cuboid tissues in your body. So let's take a look at glandular structure because different glands can be different, right? So they're just basically an aggregation or collection of cuboid cells, of 
cuboid epithelial cells. So let's take a look at this. You could imagine, and these are all basically uh, variations of what a single layer could do, right? So if you take a look at your starting point, which is one single layer of cells. So you're gonna have one single layer of cuboid cells with your free space and your basement membrane. So here's my basement membrane, here's my apical surface. If I were to pull this down, which is called invagination, it would create basically this kind of hairpin looking thing where my cuboid cells would kind of line the, the inside surface. It looks something like this. That makes sense? So if you do that, that creates what's called the simple tubular style of gland. That's just a single invagination, simple. Now, if I were to pull on this tube, like in this direction and in this direction, it would basically create like a little bulge out either way. And then I would create some branches. So this would be simple still because it's single layer, but branched tubular. So there's basically tubes that are branching out from this overall tube. Make sense? I'll be a branch of gland. Now, the other type is what's called asinar. Um, and so you can have the simple one. So in this case, what happens is how many? Six, 12, 25. Okay, so in this case, what happens is instead of pulling this out, what you do is you kind of just sort of poof out the bottom part until it kind of creates this little lobe. And that would be simple asinar. If you create branched lobes, then that's going to be your branched ASNR. So ASNR basically is these lobe-like structures. Uh, example of this is your spacious gland, which is your oil-producing glands in your skin. Okay, so these have this kind of ASNR look to them, branched ASNR. Okay, now those are simple. Let's make it interesting. Compound glands. Let's be crazy, right? So ultimately, these will oftentimes be multicellular with typically lots of stuff going on, lots of branches, lots of lobes, lots of all sorts of things going on. You have a combination of all kinds of things. You'll have, you'll have pieces of tubular in there. You'll have some ACE in our stuff. You'll have both, right? So you can kind of go all over the place now. You're kind of elongating it and sort of creating this more labyrinthine-like structure. So for instance, here is gonna be a compound tubule. So you can see how you've created multiple little avenues here, like a branching of the branch, basically. Uh, but notice it's all straight, which makes it tubular. So this would be a compound tubular. So notice the branch has branches. In this case, you notice it's a compound asinar. Why? Because each branch is lobed into smaller branches. So instead of having tubular branch subbranches, you've got lobed subbranches. That's what makes it Ace in our nature. Three is branched into three more branches, A, B, and C. Okay. That's kind of what makes it all down. The branches have branches. Or you can mix it because nobody says you have to do the same thing. So you can basically have this tubular ASNR. So where you can have, you know, tubes here and here and here and then lobes here and here and here and here. You can have a tube here and a lobe here. So you can mix and match all of these. So this would be uh, this would be a type of gland where you would have tubular asinar. This is basically what's happening in the pancreas. We have a combination of tubular and asinar. Wow, okay, now my head is spinning. But the idea is, notice what's happening. Now, when you look at it histologically, what it looks like is a pile of cuboid cells. And generally speaking, you don't ever see the differentiation between their structure because we'd really have to get like almost a perfect prep of a gland to be able to see, you know, whether it's tubular or ASNR or things like that. So if you were into endocrinology and you actually had to do um, surgery, say for instance, on on a gland like this, then you probably need to know this, right? But for the most part, you'll probably never be able to see this well.
what you'll see probably most clients looking like just from a working student's perspective, looking at a microscope of histology, is you'll see like what looks like a pile of cells that looks like a cluster of grapes, right? Or like a cluster of cuboid cells. And that's like a, a gland. Uh, the alternative that you would see, some of you guys have seen this, right? How many of you guys saw the cuboid wheel? Looks something like this. Usually there's other cuboid wheels around it. How many of you guys saw that one? Oh, you will. Hopefully, you'll see it today. You'll be looking for it, right? There's usually multiple cuboid wheels around. Uh, you'll see this in kidney and others. So like when you see this, basically what this is, is, is a gland, it's cuboid, right? But what you're looking at, is either a secretory structure where you've got something like you secretions that are coming in here, or what you're looking at is the cross section of a duct. So this is what's referred to as the lumen. This would represent the apical free space in this particular gland. Okay. So don't act surprised when we talk about epithelial tissue as gland. Now, when you're talking about secretion, of a gland, there's three major ways that you can secrete. That's actually pretty important when you're looking at glands. There's what's called the merocrine style, which basically is a cell that goes through what's called exocytosis. How many of you guys know what exocytosis is? Those of you who took general bio and remember it. So basically exocytosis is the normal cellular process of moving large molecules out of the cell by fusing vesicles to the plasma membrane. So in exocytosis, if I've got a vesicle full of stuff that I want to get outside of myself, then what I do is I basically take that vesicle, which is a membrane bound bubble. I touch the plasma membrane with it. And just like two soap bubbles touching each other, they fuse together. And when that happens, then I get a vesicle that looks something like that. And then all the contents of my vesicle come spraying out, in this case, the outside world. That's secretion. I've successfully secreted whatever that is. I've done my job. Okay. You've secreted it into the duct, and then it goes off to wherever the duct needs to go. And it does the thing. so, this is normal. This is normal cell stuff. There's nothing wear and tear about this one. This is a cell doing its job, just like a normal, everyday, average cell. Okay. Now, the next type of secretion pattern that you see is what's called apocrine. Now, this one's a little bit more destructive, but here you basically pinch off fragments typically of the cytoplasm. So you'll see little chunks of cytoplasm. So you can see here little chunks of cytoplasm that basically will get broken off and dumped into the duct in this particular case. Um, and then that represents a diminishment of the gland. So that it creates a little wear and tear on the cell. That's not normal. Cells don't usually do that. So if you're pinching off little chunks of the cell, like just little nibs of the cell, and then you kind of like dump that into the lumen, then all of the protein or the hormone that was in that little chunk then gets into the lumen and you can kind of move that out and you can utilize that. The problem is you just pinched off a piece of the cell. So you got to give that cell a little bit of time to recover. And if you continue to pinch off of it, it's going to keep getting more and more diminished and eventually it's going to compromise the health of the cell. Okay. So apocrine represents a little bit of a wear and tear process. Not necessarily the best plan in the world, but it's functional. So for instance, your apocrine sweat glands will do this. Uh, so will the mammary glands, by the way. They will do the same, uh, same sort of thing. Um, now then there's holocrine glands. Think holo, think holocaust, right? Holocaust was an era of human history where there was a massive amount of death 
right? And devastation. That's what the Holocaust is. Matter of fact, even if you use the incendiary version of Holocaust, a Holocaust is an out of control fire that typically has a completely uncontrollable behavior and it's pretty much devouring everything in its path. It's exceptionally destructive, right? Uh, if you're a fire person, this is basically what you're talking about when you say that fires, big fires, out of control fires, holocaustic fires, create their own weather. Um, that would be a holocaust, okay? Fires that have the ability to create their own weather are a holocaust, okay? From a fire standpoint. Basically what's talking, you're talking about destruction and that's what holocaust secreting does. It basically, you will shed the entire cell, the cell dies, and it releases its contents. So example of this is sebaceous glands. Oftentimes lipid bearing glands will do this. Why? Because they can't just secrete a lipid into a liquid, right? Because what happens when you mix oil and water? They separate, right? So you can't just dump a lipid into an otherwise water-based system. So you have to have a different strategy for releasing itself. This is the reason why the holocrine, the holocrine glands have cells that basically just, they spontaneously combust. They just basically die. And then when they dissolve, they basically sort of release their contents, their lipids, so that you can kind of get past that slow release problem of releasing a lipid with a water-based matrix. So you basically kill the cell, so, right? so it's pretty extreme, uh, but that's a holocrine sort of a situation. Okay, so summary of your epithelial tissue. Uh, basically, you can see this is just your person. This is just where you wrap up visually. So you have your stratified, um, tissues and you have your simple tissues, you've got your um, squamous, cuboidal, columnar, pseudo ciliated, columnar and transitional, right? Those are all different types of epithelial tissue. Notice a lot of different types of tissue, yes? Very different, very distinct. The reason, because you're deploying each one for a very specific set of functions. The reason why they're so different is because they're trying to achieve a specific different type of a function. Now, let's get to the good one. Uh, admittedly, chapter four, if you take a look at the content of chapter four, the lion's share of chapter four can be split up between epithelial tissue and connective tissue. And the biggest of those is connective tissue because you got a lot going on. So here's what we got. At this point, all we have is a line of epithelial cells, yes? We have a basement membrane, yes? But now we have nothing else. So what do we put underneath the basement membrane? Exactly, right? Everywhere you're building a tissue, think about it. You have epithelial tissue, it requires support, yes? It, if you can look at any tissue in your body, it all requires support. And that's a ubiquitous function throughout. So when you're taking a look at connective tissue, it's basically all pulled together. Support, that's the name of the game. It is a supportive tissue. It supports everything to give you structural robustness. Think about what I told you guys um, a little bit in a lab. So some of you guys were looking at reticular tissue, a couple of you guys were, right? And you're like, okay, where's the reticular tissue? And remember we said that with reticular tissue, one of the things you have with reticular tissue is that it is largely a supportive thing. It's oftentimes found in organs where if you didn't have that in there, your organ would probably resemble applesauce. Right, so that would be an example. If you didn't have any connective tissue in your body, 
what most of your body would be like is applesauce, right? Because what gives you your physical shape, your support, your ability to do a lot of this sort of stuff is the connective tissue. That's the reason why connective tissue is so important. So it's everywhere to be found. It's in every organ. Um, it actually forms in a lot of ways, organs in their own right. Um, but basically what this one is, remember when we said that the epithelial tissue is defined and dominated by characterizing its cells? That's what we went through, right? We're characterizing their cells. Are they simple? Are they stratified? Are they whatever. In this one, you are characterized by your extracellular matrix. So the tissue itself is defined by its extracellular matrix. Not so much the cells. The cells are simply there to maintain it. But what we think of as the tissue in connective tissue is actually extracellular matrix. So it's kind of a slightly different way of looking at things. And not only that, but there's a lot of diversity in the different types of connective tissues. Um, and they actually run the gamut, right? So some things where you kind of think of them as connective tissue all the way to things where you probably don't think of them as connective tissue, okay? But they all basically have the same idea. So let's take a look at a rigorous list of some of their functions. Uh, some of them obviously is they're working with organs. So they actually have the ability to close them up and to keep them closed. Right. And they also have the ability to separate them into layers. That's an important one. Um, so you have connective tissue pretty much all throughout your organ system, sort of dividing them up into chambers or to quadrants or into layers. Like, for instance, the lobes of your liver are separated by sheets of connective tissue that defines the structure and the regional space of your liver itself. So it's all basically interwoven through your organs defining their shape and their organization. Um, you can also connect one tissue to another. This is actually a really key point. I'm gonna put a little big star in there because this is how you connect yourself together. So if you're wondering how tendons connect muscles to bones and how ligaments connect bones to bones, it's because of connective tissue, okay? So your articulation, that is to say how you put your body together and how you keep your body together is a story of your connective tissue. So um, the other thing it also helps you do is support. Obviously we did that one, but movements, right? Ambulation. You're not gonna move if you don't have something to stand on, right? If you don't have a solid substrate to put your body weight on, guess what you're not doing? You're not walking anywhere. You're not moving anywhere. You are a lump of applesauce. So their connective tissue gives you the structure that you need so that you can actually have a framework to build on. Here's one. So these are basically the physical ones. These are the ones we usually think of. So these ones here, these are the obvious ones that we think of with like things like connective tissue, support structure, things like that. However, there are some like physiological ones. So these are the ones we tend not to think of. So storage, for instance, of fat. We don't think of connective tissue that way, do we? Of fat is connective tissue, adipose tissue, right? Um, cushioning, fat layer, right? And insulation, also fat layer. We we're talking about the idea of how fat can create insulation and can create variable experiences when you come to uh, being in the cold, right? So like if you have more layers of insulation, you're more cold tolerant, which is one of the reasons why mammals oftentimes will gorge in the fall as they try to bulk up for the winter, especially hibernators, right? Because the idea is if they build up their fat reserves, then it gives them the necessary insulation and the necessary energy source to be able to just hibernate throughout the winter and not have to worry about that, right? Um, transport, blood is technically a connective tissue. It's a fluid connective tissue. We'll learn about that one here in just a second. Uh, and then of course, protection of our immune cells. This basically is referring to your lymph, which is also fluid. So these are a type of fluid connective tissue. But notice interweaving throughout all of these, what's common to all of these? What's common to all of these is a common thread. You have some sort of a function that you're doing, yes? But what you need is a supportive background to do those functions against, right? 
You have blood, which is doing a job, but guess what? You need a connective tissue to support those red blood cells. You have immune cells, which are doing a job, but they need the background, so the background connective tissue to give them support and structure in the lymph, right? So you have energy storage and insulation, but you have a connective tissue fat in the background that allows you to be able to do those capacities. Notice in every single one of these cases, you have some sort of a physiological job that you're doing and the connective tissue is forming kind of almost like a foundational background strategy so that supports those activities. Think of it like a painting. If you've ever looked at a good painting, oftentimes what really makes or breaks a good painting is how you start it. Oftentimes the background of a painting sets up the necessary support that you need in order to get the image, the picture to come out, right? Um, especially if you're doing like a night sky or if you're doing a daytime sky or if you're doing a sunset, how you lay down that first background, that initial first layer of paint setting in the background is part of what brings out the nuances and it's the juxtaposition of the background against all your other pictures like the trees or the cabins or whatever you want that basically makes or breaks the picture. So the picture, the stuff you're painting, right, is, is sort of like the functional piece of it, but it requires a good strong background in order to make it all come out the way you need it to. That's very much what connective tissue is like. Connective tissue, when it's doing its job properly, you don't notice it. When it doesn't do its job properly, oh yeah, you notice it, right? Because you notice that all of a sudden your joints don't work. <laughs> the way they're supposed to. So that's kind of what you have. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at um, some of the cells of the connective tissue, uh, which actually cuts across all connective tissues of different types. And then as we sort of do our initial break in of connective tissue, we'll start parsing out the different types of connective tissue and kind of dig into those um, a little bit more specifically. Okay. But that is a tale for a different day. <laughs>